So we're in a series called Abide, and what I've done is I've taken a few, um, I've taken a few verses uh, out of First John, and then I I, I, t- I took a left turn a little bit, and I wanted to just bring a couple of one-off sermons that have to do with Abide, but they're not from First John. And this morning's sermon, <clears throat> this is not the title of the of the message, but uh, this is this is what I call abiding in the hand of God abiding in the hand of God. And we're going we're gonna to do something out of Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Jeremiah 18 on your phone, your device, whatever. But we're going to talk about the potter's wheel this morning. The potter's wheel. So here's how I want to start this. The potter's wheel, the story from Jeremiah, teaches us a lesson. And the lesson is that God takes broken things and puts them back together again better than they were before they were broken. It's, he doesn't just fix broken things. He puts them together in a way to where now they can be used by God. Because w- we come out of the womb, we're, we're doing okay. We grow up, we get a little messed up. Life throws us some curveballs. None of us are perfect. God has to take the imperfection. It comes under the cross. It comes under the blood of Jesus. God then puts us back together again, and now we went from being whole to being better than we were uh, before we were whole. In other words, God makes us better than whole. And what we do is we pray all the time to never have change in our life. We never want to have issues. We pray against so many things, and and I believe God wants to bless us. But when things don't go our way, and when there's brokenness that sets into our life, what we, what we need to understand is that God takes the brokenness and he uses it and fills it with purpose. So if you're an object, if you're somebody who's never been broken, as soon as you're broken, you have a testimony. As soon as something gets dug out of you that needs to get dug out of you, then God can fill it with his presence. And now you've got the presence of Jesus in you, where before you were a little overconfident, a little prideful, everything's going okay. But how many of you know we need Jesus, come on, we need Jesus to do something in us so that we can be used in other people's lives. So that's the big picture here. God wants to make us better than whole. Not just whole, but he wants to fill us with his purpose. Okay, so Jeremiah chapter 18, and let me read a couple of verses to you this morning. Um, and uh, I do jump around a little bit, so the guys in the back, I'm sorry, but uh, not really. Okay. Um, <laughs> chapter 18, verse 1. Verse 1. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from God. Okay, so Jeremiah now is hearing from God. Uh, This is a prophetic moment. God speaking to him, and the implications of what God is going to say to Jeremiah will have a huge impact on his destiny. So he's going to get a word. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you, I will give you my message. So Jeremiah is being told, if you want the message, you have to go somewhere, right? Right? You've got to go somewhere. So he says, okay, well, let's, uh, maybe we need to have a talk about this, Jesus. What, can, why can't you just give me the word right here? Why do I have to go somewhere? He says, but I want you to go there, and I'll give you the message. Verse 3, so I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. And so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it, as best to him. And then the word of the Lord came to me, and he said, can I not do with you, Israel, that this potter does with the clay? And so he's saying, can I, can I not shape you as a person in the way that the potter is shaping the clay? Now let me read you a couple of other, um, a couple of other versions of a couple of these verses, uh, verse three and four. Uh, this is the New Living. So I did as he told me, And I found the potter working at the wheel, but the jar that he was making did not turn out the way that he had hoped. And so the potter squashed the jar. Has anyone in the house this morning ever been squashed? (laughs) So many of you. (laughs) The potter squashed the jar into a lump of clay, and he started again. This is the amplified version. And the vessel, everyone say vessel. And the vessel that he was making from the clay was spoiled in his hand and the hand of the potter. 
And so he made it over, reworking it into another vessel. Now say another vessel. Another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make. So God takes broken things and he puts them back together again, better than they were before they were broken. So, so when my son, a few years ago, had a, he had an accident on a skateboard. Now, first of all, it wasn't a real skateboard. It was what they call a penny board, which means that you're even less intelligent when you ride it. So a regular skateboard's about this big. This is called a penny board. A penny board's about this big, right? And so if, if you get one injury on this board, it's a worse injury on this board, right? So we've had lots of discussions and jokes about this. He, he, he fell down. Uh, he was at a youth event in Vegas. He fell and had a spiral fracture of his right femur, which basically means the biggest bone, the most painful bone in your body, it, his foot got caught, his body kept moving, and it twisted the bone in half like a candy cane. Like take a candy cane and break it in half, that's what happened to my son's leg, right? It was a horrible, it was a horrible deal. And what was even worse was that we were in Vegas in the summertime and he landed on the pavement. The pavement was about 140 degrees, and so he actually had burns all the way down the left side of his body. So the poor kid, He's burned on this side of his body, and his right femur is broken, and it took him almost two years to rehab from that injury. Now, now Kai loves basketball, and I said to the doctor, to the surgeon, I said, look, um, how is this going to affect him in sports? And the doctor said, what you need to understand is that when this leg heals, it will be stronger than it was before it was broken. Because that's what breaks do. And so that's what, God is, that's, that's what God does in our lives. No one wants to have a bad day. Have you ever gotten up in the morning and just prayed for one? Lord Jesus, so thankful for all your goodness and your grace, but please, let everything go wrong today. Father, I pray for a bill to come in the mail that I didn't know about. I pray that my car would break down again. <laughs> I pray, Jesus, that I would have a, an argument with my spouse. It's been a week. Let's have another one. That's how we know we love each other. If we got through that one, we'll get through this one. No one gets up in the morning and prays for a bad day, right? But the, the truth is, the fact is that things just happen. Everyone say, say this, things happen, okay? And when things happen, when you get through them, if God is in the mix, if he's there working it out for his glory, you will actually be stronger at the end of it than you were at the beginning of it. This is how God works. And so he says, uh, he says, look, there's something I want you to do here. And I'm going to give you just, just four thoughts from, from this uh, portion of Scripture. The first one is that the journey and the word, the word that Jeremiah got concerning what he was going through and what God's doing in his life, there was a journey attached to it. So the journey and the word go together. It says this. It says, go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. Now, I understand that, but I like to have my words ahead of time. Like, when we moved here, I had to have a word from God to move from, Colorado, from Portland, Oregon to Colorado, right? I had to have a word. And my thing was, Jesus, we'll go, but Old Testament, right, the presence of God, we'll go, but the presence has to go with us. Because if it doesn't, please don't send me. Right? There, there's, a, there's a strength in knowing what the peace of God is and knowing what God's called you to do. But you know what? Words don't always come at the beginning. What God said to Jeremiah was, I'm going to give you a word, but I need you to go on a journey first. And I actually need you to go, to go find the potter, go into his house, and watch him make a pot. So God actually wanted him to have a visual aid. But Jeremiah, he could have said, you know, Lord, I would rather get the word now, because why do you want me to go down to see uh, somebody make a pot? Because I think that's, that's weird. I have to be careful with the word pot here in Colorado. I want you to know, I'm, I'm, I'm very careful with that, uh, but not this morning. You're going to hear it a lot. Just don't misunderstand me, okay? So go down, and, and uh, I want you to watch him make pot. See, this is, a, it's, this is not working. He's going to make it. Why do I need to go, Lord? Why can't I get a word right now? Because what happens is that there are some words in your life that it takes a journey to understand. You, there are some things that are going to happen in your life. God's going to give you a word, but he's going to say, I need you to go somewhere for you to understand the word. 
I need you to understand that I can't just tell you, I've got to explain it to you. I need to give you a visual aid. There's something that you need to see. And so we're walking through life, and there's things that we're going through, and, and we had a word, and we don't understand it. Sometimes you'll get a word, and you'll go through four, five, six tough things, or even some good things, and, have, and you get to the end of that journey, and then you understood the word you got 10 years ago. Because the word uh, and the, the journey are connected always. And I also think there's an obedience aspect to this. Because he could have said no. Could you imagine if God would have said to Abraham, Abraham, Hey, look, I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. What if Abraham would have said, you know, Lord, I don't think so. There's no way that I'm going to wander around in the wilderness for years and years. Why don't you just give me the map right now so I can go from here to there? Well, that's not the life of faith. The journey that Abraham went on was key for Abraham to understand his entire journey and the entire covenant that God made with him and, his, and all of his ancestors, all the way to you and I here today in the Abrahamic covenant. If you don't know what that is, just, God just made some promises back then. He had to take a journey to understand it. And so, so the journey is connected to the word. And I find that people, people have a lot of dreams and aspirations for their life. They get words for their life. But they want, they want the word without the obedience. And I just think that there's an obedience aspect to this. I think that people want a word, but they want it without the obedience. They want the result. They want the end of the thing without walking through the process that gets you. There's a refining fire that takes place in our lives. And when we're talking about pottery, right? Well, it's one thing to say God's shaping me, but it's another thing to know that God's shaping me, but the fire's next. Right? So I think that, that in our culture, we, we have such a, a culture of self-indulgence that we want the word and the fulfillment of it at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. So there are a lot of journeys you have to take if you're going to hear God's voice the way he wants you to hear it. He had to go somewhere. He had to get up. He had to go somewhere to receive the word because God was looking at his, at his obedience. Now, I've asked myself a question a few times. What kind of a word do I want? Do I want a word that leaves me the same way that I am? When God speaks to me, does God say to me, I love you, don't change? No, God says, I love you the way you are, change. Because the purpose that I've called you to is bigger than where you're at right now. Right? There's some things in your life you don't need a word for. Right? Like, you don't need a word... You don't need God to say to you, today, try not to sin. And you go, wow, I'm going to try that for the first time. That's a great idea. Uh, today, don't try not to have an argument with your spouse or whatever. There's just some things you get up in the morning, and you don't need a word for that. That's just what we do as Christians. We're trying to be the best Christians we can. But the words that we, we do need are the words that make us get up and go somewhere. There's some words, I don't need a word that leaves me, I need, I, leaves me here, I need a word that takes me over there. That's right. And the prophetic life of a Christian, where God speaks, if you believe that God speaks, and we all believe that God speaks, what happens is you have to believe that he's speaking because he has a plan. He's not speaking because he's bored. He's not speaking because he doesn't have anything for you to do. Right. He's not speaking and texting you, I don't have anything to do today, I'm God, what are you up to? He's, he's talking to you about where you're headed and where you're going. You get so much time on the earth, we're supposed to use it to lift up his name. And by the way, my prayer is that, that the name of Jesus will be lifted up all over the Denver metro area. Lord Jesus, you bless every pastor today. Come on. You bless every church, every song that's being sung, every person that walks through the door of a church. I pray that they would find the presence of Jesus there. Pass all the brick and the mortar and the coffee and, and all the stuff that we, I want them to find Jesus, right? That's what we're doing. So, so there's a purpose to everything that we're doing. So what kind of a word do we want? I want a word that actually takes me somewhere. I don't want a word that leaves me the same, and I don't want to get into the lukewarm habit of asking God to bless the things that I'm supposed to do on my own. Oh, Lord, bless me today as I pay my bills. Well, God bless you. You're such a huge Christian. You know, Lord, I, I, I've decided, I had a word from God, I decided that I'm no longer going to spend more than I make. It was a huge revelation, you know. You mean, you mean when you couldn't pay your bills? Yes, God spoke to me at that moment. No, God wants us to go into a realm where he, where he really works things out in us, right? 
And so sometimes we have to move. We have to be in movement to understand the word and to get the word. And obedience is part of that. Number two, the potter knows what the clay needs. Verse three, so I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working. Everyone say working. Now what working means is that he's beating the clay up. He's molding the clay, slamming the clay. Okay, so now when I was a kid, there were two shows that I never wanted to watch on TV that my mother made me watch. I'm convinced out of discipline, I'm sure that I did something wrong, so she made me watch the show where the guy paints. You know the guy who paints? Yeah, everybody, how did he get so famous? I still don't understand it. I don't get it. Well, I think he had a twin brother that made pottery on another show. So I would get up on Saturdays. My mom would make me sit there and watch. And keep in mind, I'm like a, I'm a little kid. I never want to, I never ever want to make a, a, a vessel. And I would have to sit with my mom. He had curly hair, a flowered shirt, and he would sit there and I would, it was torture and I'd have to watch the show. And my kids, you know, when your kids are young, they actually do pottery, you know, when they're in school or when they're in middle school. My, all three of my kids did, right? Your kids did. Uh, Kaylee was the first. She was probably eight years old. She comes home with a plate about this big, a dish. And I said, what is it? She says, it's a dish. I said, see, I knew that. I just wanted to make sure. Because, you know, you don't want to upset your child, right? It's had her name on the back. They fired it in the oven. And then it was Tessa's turn. Tessa came a couple years later. She brought us like a little, little mug thing. I still don't know exactly what it was, a, a cup. I said, that is beautiful, Tessa. That is the most beautiful um, cup I've ever seen. You know, it, it's a cup, right? Yeah, it's, just, it's a cup, Dad. It's a cup. And so now I'm thinking, I'm two for two. My kids bring me things. I know what they are. Like, you, no one's going to fool me. I'm such a good dad. Then it's Kai's turn. Kai runs everywhere, unless he's sleeping. Kai runs into the house, runs into the house, pulls this thing out, puts it right in my face. Dad, Mom, look what I got. Look what I made for you, for you. I said, son, and in my head I'm thinking, I'm two for two. That is a beautiful horse. He goes, Dad, Dad, what? It, it, it's a cup <laughs> with, with a handle. I said, it, it, it's a horse, is it a horse cup? <laughs> no, Dad, it's a cup, it's a cup. I was like, well, you know what, you know, two and one, it's okay. Um, if there's just something about it, I don't know. So, so one day I'm having a really bad day, okay? I'm having a really bad day. And that could have been a, a, a number of things at this point in my life. Um, it was a day when I was down and I was discouraged about myself. And it was right after we moved here and um, we're trying to plant the church, right? So uh, God takes me to this, to this verse and, and I get this idea, well, okay, so if God told Jeremiah to go find the potter at his house and watch him do this, the word of the Lord to me is to do the same thing. So I, I started trying to find someone who did pottery and I was just going to go watch them. And then in the middle of that, I thought, that's kind of weird. And so I pulled up YouTube. That's way better, somebody. Come on. So I pulled up YouTube, and I sit down in my living room, and I'm like, okay, Jesus, speak to me. And I found that guy from that show. And I'm thinking, I hated you as a child, but now you're the vessel of God in my life. <laughs> all right, all right, Jeremiah, speak to me. Here we go. Corny music, flowered shirt. Um, and he, he takes a lump of clay and he throws some water on it or does something and he just takes it and he just, he just slams it. Bam! Just slams it as hard as he can. And I went, okay, ouch. Okay, so I understand the metaphor, Lord, but are you saying that, you're gonna, that I'm gonna be slammed and smushed? Is that what you're saying? Okay, and then he does it again. And then he does it again, over and over and over again. Now, all of a sudden, if there must be a God, because I was having a spiritual moment. I started to think of every single time in my life 
where I, start, where I went through something really hard and God was trying to work something into me. Because what you realize is that the way that we live is that we think that maybe other people are doing something to us, but really it's God trying to work something inside of us. Now the one part of this thing, uh, this revelation I'm, I'm having through the whole process is I realized that even, in, even when it was a lump of clay, even when he was finished with the vessel, I realized that he actually never took his hand off of the pot. He never did. You see, if you're having a bad day, a good day, if it's the worst year of your life, you need to know that God's hand is still on you. Let me tell you how I wanna live. I wanna live, uh, I wanna go all out for Jesus, I wanna do everything I've been called to do, and I'll do it, but I never wanna feel a day where the hand of God is not on my life. Because I know that he's shaping, he's molding, he's working, and as long as I know that his hand is on me, I can endure anything, because God is the one who is shaping me into what he wants me to be, right? So he's slamming this thing. And I remember a few times along in early years when Donna and I were first married, and. Uh, we had our first and only argument, and I remember, I remember thinking, thinking, Lord, we had this, this argument. So we had an argument one time where you, when you get married and you're young, so this is for all the people who are not there yet. You get married and you're the guy. You, have, you are deceived into thinking that you're in charge. You are deceived. Like we come into, the, into marriage with like this, I am the man. I am the man. The first time you go on a vacation, you're like, I will pack the car. You know, there's like some unsaid thing in the universe that says men have to pack the car because there's an anointing on their life, right? And uh, to pack it. Oh, honey, I got this. You're going to, Tetris was my game. <laughs> you know, you're going to pack the car, right? There's just there's this idea. So we're having an argument. Now, we were very poor. I was a youth pastor, and I made a few hundred bucks a month full time. And then prayer covered the rest. And, and we had, but, but we had a family member that bought us this beautiful bedroom set. So we had, back in the day when four-poster beds were just awesome, right? So we had this, they bought us this beautiful four-poster bed. And we had nothing else. We sat in milk crates in the living room, but we slept in a four-poster bed. It was so high, there were two stairs to get up to it. Closer to heaven. Uh, it was amazing. I, I would go to bed like this, walking up. <laughs> eh? All right. So we're having an argument. I'm looking at my wife, my, my back is to the wall, my, my wife is staring at me, and I just got to the point where the deception overcame me, and I said to my wife, that is it. We have been married three months, and I am putting my foot down on this issue. And as I slammed my head onto the couch, I said, this is how it's gonna be, my rear end slipped off the back of the bed, I did two full somersaults backwards, boom! Boom, hit the wall, my head hits the wall, and I look up and my wife, who should be comforting me, is <laughs> laughing hysterically at me and now my pride is hurt. My pride is hurt, because I did not one somersault, you guys, two somersaults, one of them, the bed was so high, one somersault was in the air. The second one was when I hit the wall. And I did it, I said, don't you laugh at me. And I started to laugh. And um, next thing I knew, we were laughing at my pride, right? And I, it was just a horrible, it was a horrible day. And I remember, I remember thinking, okay, all right, Lord, I think I, have, I might have some problems. But I, what I want you to do is, is help me with them this way. Help my wife to never bring that up again. <laughs> because then we'll be fine, you know? And then as life goes on, you, you start telling God how it is that he is supposed to oversee your life to help you become what he wants you to be. We start to tell God how he's supposed to shape us and mold us. And so what we do is we put ourselves in the place of God. And, and, but the thing is, God's hand is never off of you, right? It's never off of you. I mean, I mean, all of a sudden, it's like God's hand is on my life, and, and I, I feel like I should be responding to him, but I want him to do it this way. And you realize you, you don't get a choice sometimes. You just don't get a choice. Um, and so let me read you a couple of verses here. This is in Isaiah 45, verse 9. It says this. Destruction is certain for those who argue with their creator. Does the clay pot ever argue with its maker does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, stop, you're doing it wrong? You're doing it wrong. 
sometimes we feel like God must be doing it wrong. Because if he, if he was doing it right, then my prayers would be answered according to my timeline and, and the way that I want them to be answered. But what we forget is that God is actually shaping us into a vessel. That, that there's some substance and some depth inside of us that we have to respond to. I don't know about you, but there were times where I was going through stuff so difficult, I wanted to jump off the wheel. You know, God's trying to get his hands on me, and I'm jumping off the wheel. There's just times where we have to submit to it and say, God, you know what you're doing. Romans 9, verse 20 says this, but who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to do, what, to do what he wants? Why did you make me like this? There's some people who honestly believe that God made them the wrong way. God, why did you make me this way? Why couldn't my life have been like this other person's life? Or why don't I have their gifts and talents? Like, like how come that this, this is the way that it is? But we need to remember that God made you and created you according to a very specific design. My very favorite scripture in the world that you've all heard if you've been here any, any time, you've heard 9,000 times. Psalms 139. For I formed you before, everyone say before. Be, before you were in your mother's womb. And I named you and I, I counted all the days that you would live even though you'd never lived any of them yet. God designed you a specific way. And so for us to say, why did you make me this way? He's just saying, if you just stay on the wheel long enough, you'll find out. Because I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you from being an object to a vessel. Okay, I'm gonna take you from just being someone and doesn't know what they're doing and you have no purpose. And all of a sudden, I'm gonna make you into a vessel. You're gonna find out. Jeremiah, or number three, Jeremiah 18, verse four. God's purpose is perfect, but we are flawed. But the pot that he was making from the clay was marred. It's bro broken his hands. So the picture here is you have God creating something, and it breaks. But if God is perfect, why did it break? How can a perfect God break something or allow it to be broken? Well, the answer is that God is perfect. He didn't break it. There was something inside the clay. There's always something inside of the clay. That's us. There's things that, that we break in the hand of the Father. Now, now there's a word here. Uh, in the NIV, it says marred. There's other versions, but there's, a, there's a, another word in the original language. And when you look it up, it actually means six different things. There are six ways that, that this word is used. So if you imagine the hand of the potter on your life breaking in the hand of the potter, it, it, the perfect God and imperfect humanity. So God's, God's perfect. He, he didn't break me. There's something in the clay. And a lot of times, you know, that could be a piece of sand, it could be a little pebble, or whatever it is, but there's something in the clay. Let me tell you the six words that this, six pictures that we get. The first one, when it says that it was marred, means to decay. There's something about the clay that decayed. Decay means to be left alone without attention, or having your needs met. There's a group of, our, there's a bunch of people out here today, a bunch of our young people, PYC, uh, youth band, everybody, they're gone. They're actually up in the mountains today with a, a group in a, in a big hall with a group of teenagers from all over the city. Many of them just found Jesus on Friday night. They got saved. They're leading worship. But there are kids there that have no home. They're, foster, they're in foster care. There are kids there that have had no meals for days and days and days. There's, there's a couple of kids that, that are in our youth ministry that when school started this year, um, there were, they didn't even have a parent to go check them in for school. So for three weeks into the school year, we said, have you, have you, how's school? They're like, we haven't even registered yet because our parents haven't even asked us when school starts. So they weren't even in school. So people in our church took them to school and registered them as their parents. See, those kids are gonna grow up knowing that there was a need that not, was not met in their life. And, and unless, if they don't find Jesus in a significant way, then what happens is insecurity can set in because they're not gonna feel as good as the other church kids. You know what I'm saying? Are you all there today? Is everybody there? Can I be real honest for a minute? Right? How many of you know that sometimes uh, Christians are the, the, the most biggest struggle in the church? <laughs> right? Because these kids are gonna grow up thinking, man, I'm not good, as good as those kids and I don't have a mom and dad and I'm sleeping in the back of a car or I'm being dropped off at somebody else's house tonight. And their insecurity, the hand of the Father is shaping them into something but their insecurity causes them to break and they pull away. 
right? This is what it means, that something's happening, insecurity, um, and, and you, you break in the Father's hand. The next word is ruin. Um, tamar means to ruin. It's a horrible, unfair event or experience that has happened to you, some event that was out of your control. Um, we have people in our church this year who have lost children. You know, we've, we've had some, um, some celebration services, going home services, but could you imagine, when, you know, mom and dad, and then something happens and your child is gone, and so out of that, that hurt and that wound and that discouragement, you break in the hand of the Father, and, 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 and you're, you're here, and, it, and, and you just kind of fall apart, right? But here's the, I want you to get this. Even when you're breaking, though, the, the key is God never takes his hand off of you. The hand of the Father never leaves your life. So we're breaking, but he doesn't go anywhere. We're breaking, and he just keeps his hand on us. It means to waste. Uh, you, it, waste means you know that you have potential, but there's no one there to help you achieve your potential. There's no one there to say, you can do this. You, you've got this. Now, that was me as a child like, growing up. I didn't have a lot of people encouraging me. Um, I, got, I got a compliment once from a, uh, a science teacher, and I had just flunked his class. And he said to me, Doug, I want to tell you something. I said, what, sir? He says, you're going, to be, you're going to be just fine. I said, really, how come? He goes, well, because you're bright. And I said, smart? He goes, no, bright. And I said, I'm going to take that as a compliment, sir, because I haven't had one for a long time. And we laughed, and he says, he says you know, you gotta, you're bright, you, you're going to work it through. But some people have potential, but there's nobody to say, you can do this. Parents, I honestly believe, you need to say to your children. I had teenagers as a youth pastor come into my office, and I would say to these young men, they'd sit in my office, I'd say, young man, and I, I'm, I mean, they're on drugs, they're getting in trouble, they're ruining the youth service, you know. We had youth services where kids would just break, in the middle of my sermon, people would just start punching each other in the face. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, what's going on right now? And I'd have to move them out, and we had, we had things blow up, we had fires set. Um, God, so many stories, so many stories. Can I tell you what my fav favorite youth service was? A kid brought a gun to youth service. And, um, and we, he showed somebody and we had to call the police. But when revival is happening, you don't stop revival. So the police show up, the SWAT team shows up. They meet me at the door, they say, where's the kid? I said, the kid's right over there, he knows you're coming. And they're like, okay, they tackle him, they arrest him. And, and one of the guys says, what is this? I said, it's a youth service. He's like, wow, got a lot of kids in there. I said, yeah, he says, can I stay? I said, absolutely, you can stay. But I didn't know what that meant. What it meant was, is that he was about a 275 pound uh, ex former football player in a flak jacket, which made him 900 pounds, and with, a, with a, a, a rifle, a 308 long rifle, and he came in and he stood in my, in my youth service between the two aisles with a loaded gun. How many of you know every kid listened to my sermon that <laughs> night? Okay? Every kid listened to my, my sermon that night. But these kids would sit there and I would say, I want you to know something. They'd be like, what? I'd say, I believe in you. And they would say, what do you mean? i said, I believe in you. I had one kid break down on me, and he said, no one has ever said that to me my whole life. You, if, if you just believe in somebody, you tell them God's got a plan for their life, he can change the trajectory of their, their purpose forever. So we, we want them to know that. So wasted means you've got potential. Perished, it's too late. What you've done is too bad, and you can't come back from that. Battered. Battered is one of the words that it means to be abused or victimized or scarred. The word scared and afraid are words that mean more to you than most people. Some people, they grow up living afraid in their own home. Afraid of what could happen to them. Afraid of their future. That's battered, battered around, right? Spilled. Tragedy. Hardship. Disaster came suddenly and stole something precious from you. These are all words that, that when, when you feel this way, you're the pot, you're the lump of clay, God's got his hand on you. Now just picture this, and, and, and when you get insecure, when you get fearful, you break in the hand of the potter, but the potter never takes his hand off of your life. And I want to live my life, I want to live my life, good days and bad days, with the hand of God on my life. If I'm in my car crying, if we go through something difficult as a family, that's okay because we're, we're all going to be with Jesus. It's going to be okay. But I want to feel his hand on my life.
Because if I feel his hand, I know he's using this for good. I know something's going to come out of this, right? Now look at the last one here. God only shapes vessels. Jeremiah 18, verse 6. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does? See, here, here's the thing about God. God does not make inanimate objects. As a matter of fact, there's a principle in Scripture called the principle of design and function, which means that every single thing that has ever been created has a function. There's nothing that does not have a purpose. You build a chair, you sit in it. Stages are meant to be, you know, stood on, and keyboards are meant to be played. Toasters make toast. Ovens cook things. There, there isn't anything. Metal is used to build carpet. We, there, there's nothing on the earth that exists that was not created that does not perform some function. So if you stand on stages and, and, and basses get played and, and drummers, they, they drum, what were you created to do? Because God does not make inanimate objects. Here's the other thing God does. God doesn't make trophies. I, just, I heard a sermon once. Somebody said, I'm, I'm God's trophy. And I went, you know what? I, I get that. He loves me. But I'm not his trophy. I'm his child. There's a difference. Because if God made trophies, that would mean that God is in a competition. That there was a race somewhere. God does not, he's not in a competition. God only makes children, sons and daughters. Now, so I'm watching the show. Okay, so I'm watching the show. And, and I'm, I'm kind of teary-eyed. The guy's beating up on the clay. And he takes the lump of clay on the wheel. And in the blink of an eye, he takes his hands from the side of the lump of clay he moves them up to the top, pushes down instantaneously. In the blink of an eye, a lump of nothing turned into a vessel. And it, it was just, it was instantaneous. God makes vessels. What the Bible says is that he took the vessel that broke and then he reshaped it into something that pleased him for his use. It doesn't say that he made you so he could set you aside and we could all look at you. He said, no, he reshaped it according to his will. So in an, in an instant, that's all it takes to go from marred and beat up and left out and nobody to talk to you and needs not met. It just takes an instant for you to understand that what God is doing is he's creating something, depth in you, a place in you that he can fill. This is how God works. This is, this is what he does. What the enemy wants to take is a trophy. God turns into triumph by adding purpose to it. See, God would love to make you or any of our young, he would love to make you a trophy. I got him. To become a trophy of the enemy simply means don't fulfill your purpose. That's what happened to Daniel. Daniel in the Bible. The enemy went out, conquered Israel, went to the temple, took all the nobles' children, put them to work uh, for the enemy. And then when the foreign kings would come in for banquets, hey, who are those kids? Oh, those are Israel's uh, top children. We took them as trophies. But what happened is, Daniel one day just decided, I'm not gonna be your trophy. I'm not gonna feel bad because everyone else is gone. There's only a few of us left and I'm not gonna give up because God's hand is on my life. See, regardless of where you're at, trapped, worried, wounded, broken, upset, mad, discouraged, despaired, depressed, it doesn't matter if God's hand is on your life, you need to get ready for him to turn your lump of life into a vessel for his use. Just like that, that's all it takes. Don't jump off the wheel. You know, you feel God's hand. You know the fire's coming. His, his, hand is still, his hand is still with you. So what I want to do is I want to pray for you. I'm out of time. i got to pray. But how many of you love Jesus? You love Jesus, okay? So abide in the hand of the potter. Abide. Stay in the hand of the master. Don't leave. Don't give up. Don't, don't crumble. Don't, as you crumble, just remember... He's there for you. Don't jump off the wheel. You might feel afraid and discouraged, but stay there because his hand is on you, shaping you. And you're gonna be better than you were before you were broken because brokenness has created in you some space for purpose. Can I hear an amen? All right, stand to your feet and let's pray. Jesus. Okay, let's, let's see if we can do this quickly. I, I'm gonna believe... God's going to do something here. Bow your heads with me just for a second. I just know in my heart that one of these words or something here meant something to somebody. 
I know that somebody here has been hurt, wounded, left out. I know somebody here has felt like you have taken yourself out from under the hand of the Father and you've been hiding, but I want you to know his hand is not off of you. His hand has never left you. He's simply shaping you and molding you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. If you know that this prayer that I'm gonna pray is a pray that where the hand of the Father continues the work that he's doing in your life and he heals you and restores you. If you know you need this prayer, I'm actually gonna count to three and then I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. Jesus, come on. Every hand that's lifted right now all over this room, I believe that God's hand, his hand is on your life. The hand of God is on your life. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't get, don't be afraid or insecure. Don't compare yourself with anyone else. Hands lifted. Now do this with me because I don't always do this, but I'm going to do it right now. We're going to do it quickly. I want you to pretend that God has just asked you to go to the potter's house. And every hand that's lifted, I want you to step out of your seat and come down here as fast as you can because I need to get this prayer, get through this prayer. Come on, if your hand is lifted, come join me down at the front. Don't be afraid, don't be worried. Don't say, Lord, can you just do this for me in my seat? Don't say that to him. Just come on down. If that's you, come on down to the front. And the rest of the church, while you're walking, they're gonna clap really loud. Come on, really loud. Come on, there you go. Both sides, both sides. Come on, I believe in God. Come on, God's doing the work. Come on, come on. That's right. Now church, church, here, here's the problem. The problem is I'm running late. But I just want you to hear me, there's already tears flowing and, and this is why. Because when the hand of the Father touches the child, it's, very, it's a very special touch. The hand of the Father should never feel abusive or, or like you're being pushed. When, they, when the hand of the Father is on the shoulder of a child, it brings security. It brings protection. It tells you that you're not alone and it's gonna be okay and that it's happening right now to this group of people. So here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna pray. Everyone, come on, pray this with me out loud. Close your eyes and say, Lord Jesus, here I am and the hand of the Father is on my life. Jesus, I am so grateful that when I wanted to give up, when I made mistakes, when sin overtook me, your hand never left me. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me, for loving me, for shaping me and molding me. Now look, now look at this. Say, Jesus, when I get through this, I will be better than I was before. Come on, say that again. Jesus, when I get through this, I'm going to be better than I was before. Come on, say it one more time. Jesus, when I get through this, I'm going to be better than I was before because of you. Come on, tell them. Jesus, I love you this morning. I thank you so much for what you're doing in these people's lives. Leaders, please, some leaders come down to pray. Do not leave this altar until you get prayed for. And why don't you lead us in a song just for a minute while we do this.